repeating arms in early America. Joseph Greenlee, Director of the Office of Litigation Counsel for the National Rifle Association Institute for Legislative Action. Joseph, the floor is yours. Uh, good morning. My name is Joseph Greenlee. Uh, I want to thank you all for having me. I want to thank SAF and the Citizens Committee for the invitation, and I want to congratulate SAF on their 50th anniversary. We are living, all living in a much better country than we otherwise would be if not for SAF and for really the lifetimes that Alan and Julianne have devoted to protecting our rights. And uh, with Adam Crowd as the executive director, I could not be more enthusiastic and optimistic about the future of the organization. Uh, I was thinking when about all the 50th anniversary stuff and uh, how much progress we've made over the last 50 years. Uh, certainly throughout my lifetime and in the most recent years, it seems that we are losing rights in every aspect of our lives at a rapid rate. But the exception to that is the right to keep and bear arms. So 50 years ago, there was a prevailing argument that the Second Amendment protects some uh, collective right that maybe belongs to states. And in 2008, in the Heller decision, the Supreme Court held that no, as the founders intended, this protects an individual right that belongs to each of us individually. Uh, there was an argument that the Second Amendment restricted only the federal government from infringing on our rights, and then in Saf's win in the 2010 McDonald case, the Supreme Court said no, uh, it protects you against state infringements as well. And then uh, the trend for shall issue carry laws began in the mid-1980s, and then in the uh, NRA's win in the 2022 Bruin case, the Supreme Court held that may issue laws are unconstitutional, uh, indicated that the most restrictive laws states can pass are the uh, shall issue laws, and now we have 29 states with constitutional carry. So there's a lot to be proud of and, and good reason to be hopeful uh, that we can continue to make progress in reclaiming our rights in the future. Uh, but I'm actually not here to talk about any of that uh, today. I thought it'd be interesting to discuss repeating arms in early American history. Many of you have likely heard the argument that the Second Amendment shouldn't protect weapons like the AR-15 because these weapons were unimaginable to the founders at the time they ratified the Second Amendment. And likewise, in court, we often hear that uh, the government argues that they should be held to a lesser burden because uh, these, you know, when we challenge so-called assault weapon bans, because these uh, weapons represent dramatic technological changes that were unforeseeable at the time of the founding. Uh, to be sure, even if that were the case, that shouldn't matter. The Supreme Court has made clear in the Heller decision that the Second Amendment protects modern weapons, just as the First Amendment protects modern forms of speech, and the Fourth Amendment applies to uh, modern forms of search. But in any event, the founders were certainly aware of repeating arms. They embraced them, and they never did anything to restrict them. In fact, no state uh, nor the federal government restricted repeating arms, even through the 19th century when we saw the explosion in popularity of all sorts of repeating arms, including Colt revolvers, Winchesters, semi-automatics came into the market. Uh, with the exception of Florida passed uh, racist licensing law in 19, or I'm sorry, 1893. But as uh, Harold Peterson, the great 20th century arms historian, explained, the desire for repeating arms is about as old as firearms themselves. In fact, repeating arms have existed for half a millennium. Uh, the first known repeating firearms were 10 shot matchlock arquebuses, uh, built sometime between 1490 and 1530. Uh, King Henry VIII owned one. Uh, he reigned from 1509 to 1547. And he also owned another interesting multi-shot weapon. It was uh, called the Holy Water Sprinkler. It's this large club, had four nine-inch barrels coming out of it, and two of the barrels had six spikes each attached to them. And uh, it was made in Germany, but it was actually called uh, Henry Lay's walking stick because he would go in disguise at night and roam around the cities, make sure things were kept in order as he desired. And uh, as a quick story, one time he was arrested, and the arresting officer th feared execution when he realized he had arrested the king, and uh, instead Henry VIII gave him a raise for doing his job properly. The, the first known repeater capable of firing more than 10 shots was invented by a German gunsmith in the 1500s. Uh, it could fire 16 superposed rounds in Roman candle fashion, meaning that uh, each shot fired one after another, really what, whether you wanted to or, or not. You had to fire all 16 at once. There was no like firing twice and then waiting maybe firing another if you needed it. A uh, similar mechanism was patented by Charles Cardiff in England in 1682. Uh, it appears he developed pistols, muskets, and uh, carbines using this Roman candle fashion. Uh, several other types of repeaters were invented in 17th century Europe. 
and they were typically too expensive or unreliable to become common, but at least two gained some popularity. The first was a Kaltoff repeater, which was made in Denmark by 1645, and uh, it used two magazines, one for powder and one for balls, and these weapons could hold up to uh, 30 rounds in a magazine. And uh, the firearms were used by the Danish military, and they were sold everywhere from London to Moscow. Uh, the other type of repeating arm that gained some popularity were the Lorenzonis, which were invented in Italy, but uh, Lorenzoni pattern firearms, pistols, and long guns gained uh, some popularity all throughout Europe. They typically fired uh, about seven shots consecutively. Some European made repeating arms reached the American colonies during the 1600s, uh, including one, a 10-shot repeater made by the famous English gunsmith, John Cookson. Um, one of these firearms was believed to have been brought to America by one of the first settlers in Maryland. Uh, newspaper articles and advertisements show that Americans continued to possess repeating arms throughout the uh, early 1700s. John Pym was a Boston gunsmith who demonstrated an 11-shot repeater that he uh, produced in 1722, and he also produced a six-shot revolving firearm. Uh, in 1730, another Boston gunsmith, Samuel Miller, demonstrated a 20-shot repeater uh, that he was selling and would demonstrate for a fee. And uh, a gentleman named Joseph Massey passed away in South Carolina in 1736, and his estate sale shows that he had possessed a uh, six-shot repeating arm that he left behind. Then in April 1756, uh, John Cookson, who some believe is a descendant of the English gunsmith John Cookson, he advertised in the Boston Gazette uh, twice in April 1756 a uh, gun that he made and was selling from his home in Boston that he described as a handy gun that will fire nine times distinctly, as quick or as slow as you please, with one turn with the handle of the said gun. During the Revolutionary War, Joseph Belton, he was an inventor uh, born in Connecticut, he, living in Philadelphia at the time, and a friend of uh, Benjamin Franklin. Uh, he turned his mind to military inventions. Uh, the first one, unfortunately, didn't come to fruition, but he offered to the Pennsylvania Committee of Safety the submersible machine that would take him with a cannon underwater, get him up alongside a British ship, it would elevate him to the surface, and then he would just appear and shoot a hole th uh, through the side of the British ship with a cannonball. Um, but more relevant to our discussion, uh, Belton informed the Continental Congress on April 11, 1777, that he, invent, he had invented a uh, common small arm that could discharge 16 or 20 rounds in 16, 10, or five seconds of time. Uh, that summer, so the Continental Congress was very interested. They sent some people out to check out this gun, including uh, uh, famous generals, Horatio Gates, Major General uh, Benedict Arnold, um, leading scientists like David Rittenhouse, and they attested that Belton discharged 16 balls loaded at one time. Uh, the Continental Congress then ordered 100 of Belton's guns, but the uh, deal fell through. Belton demanded too much money, and the Continental Congress did not have much. So the, the deal fell through, but the example still proves that the founders knew about repeating arms. Certainly, they embraced them, they wanted them. And uh, among the many notable members of the Congress who sought to purchase Belton arms, Belton's arms were Roger Sherman, who signed the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, uh, Samuel Adams, John Hancock, future Supreme Court Justices Samuel Chase and James Wilson, the first Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, John Jay, and future President John Adams. As for Belton, he moved to England, where he produced repeating arms for the East India Company. When the Second, Amend second Amendment was ratified, the state-of-the-art repeater was the uh, Giordani, it was an air rifle, uh, can consecutively shoot up to 22 shots, and although it was an air gun, it was powerful enough to take a, an elk with one shot and ballistically equal to a powder gun. Uh, in fact, several air guns were made in the late 1700s uh, for the purpose of big game hunting and military use. Uh, the Giordani was invented for the Austrian army around 1779, and it stayed in a service for uh, they issued 1,500 to sharpshooters, and they remained in service for 25 years, including in the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, in addition to the roughly 20 or so rounds that could be stored in the gun at once, Austrian soldiers would typically carry two additional pressurized butt reservoirs and uh, four additional tubes containing 20 balls each, so they could fire quickly up to 100 shots. And as a testament to the rifle's effectiveness, Napoleon would, when he captured the rifleman, he would treat him as terrorists and torture them and execute them to, in the hopes of deterring other Austrian men from joining these air rifle companies. 
Meriwether Lewis carried one of these Giordanis on the Lewis and Clark expedition. Uh, he purchased it in Pennsylvania, possibly from a uh, clockmaker, Isaiah Lukens, who sometimes made guns on his own time. Uh, the air gun proved extremely important on the expedition, although they got off to a rocky start with it. So we picked it up in Philadelphia, Meriwether Lewis, and then in the first entry in the Lewis and Clark journals on August 30th, 1803, uh, he explains that he's around Pittsburgh. Some men call him up to demonstrate his air rifle to him. And he shoots, I think it's seven shots successfully from 55 yards. And uh, then somebody comes up and says, can I try that out? And this guy picks up the gun, accidentally fires it, hits a lady in the head. Uh, she's gushing, she goes down, gushing blood from her temple, but uh, fortunately, she was okay, it just uh, grazed her temple and she popped up and they concluded she was just fine and continued on their way. Uh, fortunately, after that mishap, they had more luck throughout the rest of the expedition. Um, they mentioned it at least 39 times in the journals and every single time it's when they encounter a new American Indian tribe and you know they want to impress them and make the point that they can, immediately the first thing they do is start shooting their air rifle to make the point that uh, they may be smaller, but they're still capable of defending themselves. And uh, they deliberately gave the impression that every man on the expedition had the rifle, even though, in fact, only Lewis had it. The first uh, American military contract for repeating arms was the U.S. Navy's 1813 contract with Joseph Chambers. Chambers produced what he called machine guns, uh, which included long and short swivel guns, muskets, and pistols. Chambers' muskets fired up to 12 shots consecutively and his uh, pistols fired up to six. Most impressive were his swivel guns, which were commonly composed of seven or eight uh, musket barrels. They contained 25 shots in each and could thus fire up to 200 shots in quick succession. The swivel guns he made for the Pennsylvania militia had 224 shot capacities. Uh, it's also worth noting that Americans could own cannons in the founding era. Uh, President Biden repeatedly tries justifying his uh, proposed bans on so-called assault weapons by uh, asserting that people couldn't own cannons in the founding era. He says, it's not a right to protect any gun that you want. You couldn't own cannons in the founding era. Uh, that's not true. People certainly did. Uh, to provide a few examples, frontiersmen in colonial and founding era America often kept cannons uh, to defend fortified buildings against attacks by the French, Spanish, and Indians. Uh, when the Quaker dominated Pennsylvania legislature, in uh, 1747, refused to fund a militia. Benjamin Franklin and his friends arranged a lottery so that they could purchase uh, privately owned cannons and they borrowed some others. During the French and Indian War, Georgia authorized militia officers to impress privately owned cannons for use by the militia. In 1774, leading up to the Revolutionary War, Samuel Adams complained that the British were seizing privately owned cannons. That was one of his uh, grievances. And then during the Revolutionary War, uh, New Jersey borrowed three privately owned cannons to form an artillery company. Um, maybe most significantly, colonial newspapers often contained advertisements for cannons just from people publishing, announcing that they're selling their cannon and looking for another private owner to purchase it. So uh, in conclusion, based on the founders' knowledge and their embracing of repeating arms and the advancements in arms technology that they witnessed during their lifetimes, uh, it is implausible to suggest that the common firearms of today would make them rethink the Second Amendment. Thank you.